Hey everybody, welcome. Great to have you. Uh, so glad that you're here. Welcome all campuses and venues. I know Aurora is joining us and also Restoration. Welcome. Uh, this is a great weekend, not just because of the weather, but uh, here at the Hudson campus we are going to be baptizing 35 people this weekend and then 20 next weekend. And I love uh, baptisms. Yeah, thanks. Uh, baptism is a, a declaration of something that's happened inside you. That's why we put your story up on the screen, and it's your chance to say, this is what Jesus did for me, and, and now I'm, I'm declaring this to you. This is the way I want to live my life. I'm going to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, I was reminded of uh, Chuck Colson. I remember reading a story about him. He was uh, involved with Watergate, with uh, Richard Nixon. He ended up going to jail, and he found Jesus. And uh, he had a press conference when he got out of prison because some people uh, thought it was not a genuine conversion, that it was a jailhouse kind of conversion. And Chuck Colson at this press conference said, for those of you who don't think this is genuine, I have two words for you. Watch me. And then he walked away. That was his whole press conference. Uh, that's kind of what baptism is. You're giving a bunch of people uh, permission to watch you as you follow him. So if you have not yet been baptized, uh, I just want to invite you to uh, go ahead and sign up. You can sign up in the atrium here in Hudson. If you're at Aurora, you can talk to Pastor Mark Lyle or Mark Walls or somebody and get signed up. But it's important. It's a great thing. All right. We are in the second week of a four-week series on the life of Joseph. Uh, Joseph's story starts in Genesis chapter 37 and goes all the way to Genesis chapter 50. Uh, it's a great story. Go ahead and read it in the next couple of weeks. It is a page-turner. Uh, it is, at the very least, very intriguing. You know, last week, the opening message was uh, I entitled, When God is Invisible. Because when you read the story, one of the things that will become obvious, I think, is that it seems like God is absent. When Joseph needed God the most, it seems like God is nowhere to be found. Until you get to, to chapter 50 and you look back on Joseph's life, then God is all over the place. And that's true of you, too, and of me, our lives. You know, last week when I was giving the message, I said that uh, the three parts were when God is invisible, he is working for your sake, for his sake, for their sake. It, it must have struck a chord. I talked to more people in between services and more people emailed me about what it meant to them. And I just want to encourage you. you know, the main point, I think uh, the seminal point last week, was God's plan for Joseph, God's love for Joseph, both were completely compatible with terrible things happening in Joseph's life. That's true of you too. God's love for you, God's plan for you, completely compatible with some really hard things happening in your life. All right, be encouraged. All right, we, are, uh, we, we made it to chapter 39. That's what we're going to look at today. Chapter 39, uh, Joseph has been sold into slavery by his brothers, so he's been dragged off screaming, crying. He ends up in Egypt on a block, and people bid on him, and he is bought by a man named Potiphar. And the question is, how will Joseph respond? What will Joseph do? He's at a crossroads, and the decisions he makes now will determine the kind of man he ends up becoming. All right, so if you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 39. <clears throat> and I'm going to read uh, the whole chapter. It's 23 verses. Uh, so just follow along with me, or you can look up on the screen. It's what it says. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, 
And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance, and after a time his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he's put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except yourself, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her, or to be with her. But one day, when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was there in the house, she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came into me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her until his, his master came home, and she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought among us came in to laugh at me. And as soon, but as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. This is God's word. <clears throat> now, I used to think um, that that story was all about a temptation about sex. And uh, by the way, every temptation is a crossroads. That's why I titled this message, Crossroads. Uh, every temptation you have, it's almost like the old uh, cartoon where you have uh, a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other, and they're trying to get you to go in opposite directions. Every temptation is a fork in the road, and every decision you make takes you further down to a road. Every, every step is taking you somewhere. But when I look at this chapter, it's more than just a crossroads about sex. It's actually three different crossroads. It's a crossroads about power, and it's a crossroads about sex, and then it's a crossroads about disappointment. All right, let me start with power. Um, power, there are always two ways to use power, two different roads of power. In this passage, it starts out by saying that Potiphar was the, the chief, uh, the captain of the guard, an officer of Pharaoh. And that sounds like he is like the head of his security detail, like the chief bodyguard. But that word, uh, the captain of the guard, is the same word that's used in 2 Kings chapter 25 about a Babylonian general named Nebuzaradan. Nebuzaradan actually was the general who sacked Jerusalem. He was like a four-star general. So Potiphar was extremely powerful. And then as you listen to me read the first five or six verses, what you heard over and over again was that Joseph was put in charge of everything that Potiphar had. Joseph was put in charge of everything. He just says it over and over again. And that word that Joseph was the attendant of Potiphar is the same word that described Joshua's relationship with Moses. So Joseph is like the COO, the chief operating officer for Potiphar's whole household. All right, so there's a lot of power floating around in this household. And then you get to uh, verses 6 and 7. It says, uh, So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him 
He had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance, and after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. So Joseph was kind of the whole package. He was handsome, he was smart, he was fit, and now Potiphar's wife saw him and wanted him. Now, it seems, even in the English, a little abrupt. She says to him in the English, lie with me. In the Hebrew, it's even more abrupt and a little more vulgar. In the Hebrew, it's just two words. And what she says to him is basically this, sex now. Right? Sex now. That's not your normal seduction. She wasn't going, hey, would you sit down and have a cup of coffee with me? Let's watch a movie together. Tell me about yourself. No, this was not a seduction. This was a command by a woman who was used to having a lot of power and using her power to get what she wanted, right? Two ways to use power. When you look at the way Joseph uses his power in Potiphar's household, it says that he used his power to bless. He was always using his power to serve and to bless others. That means Joseph, now you got to get this, Joseph was a slave, which meant that he wasn't going to get a bonus at the end of the year. He was never going to get his freedom. The more valuable he became to Potiphar, the, more, the less likely he would ever be set free. But Joseph used his wisdom, his time, his energy, his resources, everything that he had to serve and to bless others. All right? There's a difference there. I was with a group of people. We were talking to Michael Ramsden like three weeks ago when he was here. And he was talking about uh, being asked by uh, big businesses to come in and talk about the importance of integrity in the workplace. And then he kind of went off on a side tangent on work. And he said stuff that was so profound so quickly that all of us that were there were going, wow, what did he just say? What he said was this, that the average person, whether they're Christians or non-Christians, give the same answer to the question, why do you work? You ask a Christian, why do you work? You ask a non-Christian, why do you work? They normally will say the same thing. They'll say, to put food on the table, to put clothes on my back, and I might, you know, to to just uh, provide for my family. Now, what Michael Ramsden said is that when you look at the Sermon on the Mount, for a Christian, that's exactly the wrong answer, according to Jesus. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, do not worry about what you will eat, Do not be anxious about what you will wear. And then he says, because all the pagans do that. The pagans work because they're worried about what they will eat and what they will put on. They worry about how they're going to provide for themselves. But what Jesus says is, your heavenly Father provides for you. And then Ramsden took us to John chapter 21. In John chapter 21, Peter goes fishing. And uh, it's after the resurrection He doesn't know what else to do. He takes the disciples. He said, let's go fishing. They fish all night long in the deep. And that's when you you actually catch fish. Didn't catch a thing. He had been fishing all night. Didn't catch a thing. Coming in, in the shallow water, Jesus is on shore. He says, cast your net on the right side of the boat. What he's telling him to do is fish. And the disciples do that. Peter has them cast the nets on the right side of the boat, not because he thinks they're going to catch anything. It's not to provide for himself. He does it simply because Jesus tells him to. And what Ramsden said then was this. It was the first time in Peter's life when he worked the way God intended for him to work. He worked just because Jesus said to work. This is what's interesting, is that God wanted to send somebody to Egypt to have an impact on Egypt. He didn't send a preacher like me. He didn't send a missionary. He sent a businessman. A businessman who would use his wisdom and his power and his resources and his time and his energy not to try to get something for himself, but to serve other people. And when he does, what, Pot- what it says is that Potiphar recognized that something was different with Joseph and that the Lord was with him. And the way Joseph worked pointed him 
toward God. I should imagine what it would be like if every single person in our congregation worked not for what you could get, but worked in order to give, in order to serve someone else. Uh, I was reading a, a story about a pastor who um, saw a visitor. She came into his church, and he did what I do when I see a visitor. He uh, talked to the visitor, and then he said, what, <clears throat> I always ask, what brought you to our church? How'd you get here? And so he asked this woman that, and she said, uh, I'll tell you, uh, I was at work, and I uh, worked for a company, and I made a mistake, and this mistake was so uh, bad that it was going to cost me my job. And my boss took the blame for my mistake. I had never seen anything like that before. I had seen bosses take credit for people who worked for them, but I never saw a boss take the blame. And he took the blame because he felt like he could absorb that hit without getting fired, but he knew I couldn't. And I went into his office and I said, well, why would you do that? Why did you take the blame for what I did? And the boss said, do you really want to know? And she said, yeah, I want to know. He said, close the door. So she closed the door, and he said, I'm a Christian. Jesus took the blame for me, and that shapes everything I am and everything I do. That's why I took the blame for you. And then she said, how can I find out more about that? And she told the pastor, he said, to come to this church. That's why I'm here. Two different ways you can use power. Two different ways you can use your wisdom your energy, your resources, your money, everything. You can either use it to try to get people to serve you, use it to get what you want, or you can use it to serve others and to, uh, and to give yourself away for them. Jesus used his power to give himself away for you. Oh, oh this is something you should note too. At every crossroads, Jesus came to the same crossroads, whatever temptation you have, and he, and he went a certain way. And whenever you choose to follow him, you choose that way. Power. Okay. The second crossroads is sex. So this uh, the Potiphar's wife says to Joseph, um, sex now, right? She says it twice. She says in verse 8 too. This, is, um, this was counterintuitive to me. I didn't expect this. The temptation was two words. His response was 35 words in Hebrew. I would expect that to be the opposite. I thought temptations would be more convoluted, and then the resistance to temptation would be like, just say no to drugs and walk away. That's not the way it works. This is Joseph's response, uh, verse 8. It says, but he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he's put everything that he has in my charge. He's not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except yourself, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? What I want you to notice is that he doesn't say, uh, I, can't, I, I can't, sex is wrong. What he says is, I can't. Sex with you is wrong. And the reason is, you're not my wife. You're somebody else's. Let me give you a, kind of a brief, kind of biblical view of sex. Because sex was intended by God to do something particular. Whenever I do a wedding ceremony, I almost always say the same thing. It's a quote from Jesus, where he says, For this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and the two shall no longer be, be two, but they shall be one. And what God has joined together, let no one tear apart. Right? The physical act of sex is reserved for marriage because in marriage, what, it, what someone is saying when they get married is I am giving myself completely and exclusively to you. We are going to be one. We're going to be one in every way you can be one, economically, legally, emotionally, spiritually, and finally, physically. When you pull out physical, when you say to somebody, I want your physical body, but I don't want to give myself completely to you, then the, just like there are two ways to use power, there's two ways to use sex. This way, um, 
Tim Keller puts it like this, and I, I like this. He says, if physical union is just an expression of what you've done with your whole life, then sex deepens trust. But if you have sex outside marriage, what you're actually saying is, I want physical oneness, but I don't want whole life oneness. Let's give ourselves to one another physically, but let's, let's not give ourselves to one another completely. What you're actually saying is, I want you, but I don't want to trust myself to you. I want to be able to still make unilateral decisions. I want my possessions and my goods to belong to myself. I still want to belong to me. When the Bible talks about sexual integrity, here's what it's doing. It's saying integrate your body with the rest of your life. If you've given your whole life to someone, your whole life, every aspect, legally, economically, socially, spiritually, then you can give your body. If you haven't given your whole life, don't give, up your, don't give your body. Don't split these things out. Um, whenever you do, what you do is uh, you... The difference between love and lust is this. Love is always giving. Lust is always getting. Always seeing what it can do for you. Same thing with pornography, by the way. And I know that pornography is epidemic with men, and it's becoming worse with women. And so I, I'm under no illusion that pornography has escaped our church and, the, and, and you guys. And so what I, what I want to tell you is that pornography uh, reverses the flow. Uh, love is supposed to be sex and intimacy. is supposed to be giving to the other person, right? What pornography does is, is you become a receiver. You become a user. It becomes about you. You become more and more selfish. And with every click of the mouse, with every... Every sight that you see, you're taking a, a step further down a particular path. So I just want to... Now, what's interesting is when Joseph resists temptation, uses those 35 words, right? He, he talks to himself, and he, talk, he says it out loud so he can hear it out loud. There's a reason for that. If you come to a crossroads with sex, you better... If, if you're going to be kind of blindsided like he was, where he's walking through a house and all of a sudden there's this woman who says, sex now, you better be prepared to have an answer for yourself. Because your mind has to talk to your heart before your heart talks to your mind. Um, seven years ago, I decided to do an Ironman triathlon with my son, Jeremy. Um, I thought it would be a good father-son experience. But for those of you who don't know, an Ironman triathlon is an endurance race that involves three different things. You swim for 2.4 miles. For us, that meant in the Ohio River. Then you get, off, get out of the water and you bike for 112 miles. Then you get off a bike and you run a marathon, 26.2 miles. It's crazy, right? It, anyone who does an endurance race, you need, to know, you need to be prepared to talk to your mind when your mind starts to ask the question, what are you doing, <laughs> right? Why are you doing this? For me, I knew that once I got out of the water, and the water's the first thing, that I would get on the bike and I could maybe see Jeremy a couple times no matter how far he was ahead of me because the, the, it looped back and I might be able to talk to other bikers, so I might get some encouragement there. And then on the marathon, I knew that my good friend Christianica was going to go with me and so I was going to be with somebody who would encourage me, so I didn't worry about that as much. But the water, I was all alone. And it didn't take very long, probably 45 minutes into the swim, that I started to hear that voice say, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? You could die out here, right? But I was prepared, and this is what I thought of. I thought of the end. I thought of how good it would be to hug Jeremy at the finish line, to have pictures taken, to have a memory, to have our little medals, to just say, I did this. I did this. So I would tell myself, I talked to myself for the next 45 minutes, this is what you train for. It's, going to be, it, it's not going to last forever. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Joseph talked to himself. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was alone. And when he started to ask questions. And he went to God and he said, God the Father, and he said, I don't want to do this. Is there any way we can get away from this? Philippians 2 tells us what he thought of at that time, what he fixed his mind on. Philippians 2 said, Who for the joy set before him endured the cross? Who for the joy set before him endured the cross? 
Here's the question. What could Jesus have after the cross that would give him joy, that he would call his joy, that he couldn't have before the cross? And the only answer to that question is you. You. Your face is what he thought, but for the joy for that face, I will endure the cross. When Joseph begins to reason with himself, to talk to himself, he says, after all that Potiphar has given me, how could you ask me to do this against him? If he can say that about Potiphar, can't I say that about Jesus? When I'm at at a crossroads of temptation, can't I say after all that Jesus did, after Jesus calling me his joy and enduring the cross, can't I follow him here? All right, that's the crossroads of sex. The final crossroads is probably the most difficult. What I'm calling the crossroads of disappointment. It could be disillusion or anything like that. What happens, verse 20, is this. And Joseph's master took Joseph and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. After Joseph did everything right, he was thrown in a dungeon. That's like... You, when you do everything right and your spouse still walks out on you. After you raise your kids and you try to give them everything that you can possibly give them, all that you can do to pour yourself into them and still they walk away from God and walk away from you. That's when you're at a crossroads. And it's not about power and it's not about sex. It's about God himself. Will you continue to hang on to God? Let him hang on to you. Or will you go down a road of darkness and say, you know what? I'm too disappointed in him. I'm too disillusioned. This is what it says in the next verse. The very next verse, it says, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. I thought, what what would it be like to experience steadfast love when you're in a dungeon? That's hard. That means you've got to be looking at other stuff than the most obvious thing. Remember when my little brother died, the hardest thing for me was it was not just, I would focus just on that, just on the death of, of my brother John. And I would see nothing, I was seeing nothing else. And finally, the thing that finally helped me was when I started to lift up my eyes and look at other things and all the other things that God had given, all his steadfast love. And there were hundreds, thousands of things. And the other thing that helped me was to remind myself that the story wasn't over, that someone was still writing the story that God himself was writing the story. I was thinking this, that one of the things I want that this series to do, and I mentioned it last week, is we have this overarching story and all these sub-stories that go into it, and I want to to keep telling the overarching story and all these sub-stories so that when you are in the midst of darkness, you'll be reminded of the truth. Here we have Joseph. We know the end of Joseph's story. We know that in the dungeon, that was where he met the cupbearer. If, if he hadn't been in the dungeon, wouldn't have met the cupbearer, wouldn't have been brought to Pharaoh, wouldn't have become second to Pharaoh, wouldn't have saved all the people that he saved. But the overarching story is that of Jesus. And I think of uh, Jesus dies on a Friday. He resurrects on a Sunday. But in between, there's Saturday. And Saturday had to be the darkest day of all for the disciples, because all they see is the darkness and the sorrow. They don't see the light and the joy yet. Some of you are struggling. You're in the Saturday, and you're tempted to feel like God has forsaken you. Don't. He hasn't forsaken you. The overarching story is one of joy and light. You're at a crossroads. And the question is, will you continue to follow him? Because he is the author. He's the one who went before you. He's the one who endured the Friday and rose in glory on Sunday. And he did it because you're his joy. Know the story. Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, thank you for uh, your grace to us. Uh, thanks for um, the opportunity to, u- to use our power, uh, our wisdom, our energy, 
uh, our gifts, our talents, our time to serve and bless others. And I pray that we will all begin to do that in our places of work and in our homes so that people will begin to look at us and say, what, what, is, what is that about? I've never seen anybody uh, use their power for others and not for themselves. Help us to be like that. I pray that you'll help us when we need to have our, an answer ready to have our heads talk to our hearts, to remind ourselves of who you are and what you've done for us. And I pray that in the midst of darkness, you'd remind us of this overarching story that, that it may be Saturday now, but Sunday comes. And with it, your power, your love, your glory. Thanks for your grace. And your son, Jesus, we pray this in his name. Amen.